Hello fellow Minecrafters, Gearsaw Studios here. Today I'm going to show 1.17 Caves and Cliffs. As I am pleased to say, the 1.17 Caves and Cliffs Part 1 update has released today. So, before we look at it, remember, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. So, let's look at the new update. First off, one of the biggest changes done is all the ores have gotten re-sprites to make them more colorblind friendly. As you can see, Lapis has a bit more contrast, Emerald has a complete overhaul, Redstone now looks more like dust, Gold is just different, and a new ore, Copper, has been added, along with Iron, Coal, and Diamonds all getting re-sprites. So, one of the biggest features is copper being added, the first ore in quite a while for the overworld. So, here we have the new ore, copper ore. It's most commonly found around Y48 to 52, unlike other ores which are most commonly found at about Y12. So, copper is mostly used for building and crafting, but mostly just building. And, when mined, has a chance to drop more than one, and it drops raw copper. Raw copper can be smelted down into copper ingots, which can be then be used for building. The ore is also affected by fortune. As you can see, I'm getting quite a bit more copper from mining this with fortune versus just mining it with a normal pickaxe. The raw ores can also be compacted into raw ore blocks for faster storage and building purposes. However, they cannot be smelted into their block forms immediately, which means you will have to unpack them to smelt them to get their block forms. So, we have a new block for building and compacting. Copper, gold, and iron all are now affected by a new form of dropping system, which is dropping raw versions of themselves. And now they can be fortuned. As you can see, gold and iron, mining them, I get raw gold, and they are affected by fortune. So, fortune versus these ores will finally be useful rather than being better to probably just silk touch them, or just mine them normally because they had the same drops. Raw copper, gold, and iron can all be smelted in furnaces and blast furnaces, and when smelted, turn into their ingot form, which more or less makes them the same as before, except for gold and iron now drop more of themselves. So, mining gold and iron is now a bit more effective and does not completely invalidate iron and gold farms at the same time. When mining, you might find the newest structure, the amethyst geode, which is a place where amethyst grows. It is comprised of a new block known as smooth basalt, calcite, which is unobtainable in any other form besides the geodes, and the amethyst blocks themselves, which can mostly be used for building. Some of these amethyst blocks can also bud amethyst crystals, which can be mined to get amethyst shards, which can be used for crafting purposes, such as eyeglasses and tinted glass. The amethyst that grows the buds cannot be silk touch, making these areas a special area for mining amethyst, which means it's kind of like a mob spawner, where you have to build it at the area of its location, rather than moving it to a more preferable location. The amethyst buds themselves drop shards depending on how big they are, and are affected by fortune. However, you can silk touch them for a unique state for each amethyst bud, which can be placed somewhere else for your builds. Over here, we have a new block known as the glow lichen. It just grows on walls and caves and must be sheared or else it won't drop itself. When combined with shears, it will drop itself and it can be bone milled and will grow similar to vines. However, you cannot climb them, as you can see here. And if you bone meal them, Craft that into bone meal. 
it will grow another glow lichen, making it farmable for all of your glow lichen needs. In order to get the new smooth basalt blocks from the geodes without having to constantly find and destroy geodes, you can smelt normal basalt into smooth basalt, which means you can just slap some into your auto smelter or furnaces in order to mass produce this, which will add another usage to basalt farms. A new amazing block for builders like me has been added, known as the candle. Candles can be placed down and can also be lit by flint and steel. Candles can also be dyed within the crafting table interface. As you can see, that candle has been turned into a red candle, which can be placed down just like a normal candle and lit like normal. All candles, including red candles, can be placed on cakes, but if you try eating the cake, they will pop off. You can also light the candle for a true birthday party experience. There are 17 different variants of candles, which 16 are dyed and one is the normal variant. They all have the same physics, can be placed on cakes, can be lit, destroyed, all that, and can be placed in groups of four. Copper from earlier has a lot of uses, including crafting blocks in groups of nine, which is a little expensive, however, given that they drop multiple pieces when mined and are affected by fortune, this shouldn't come into play very often. And if you place four blocks together in a crafting grid, you can create a new block known as cut copper, which is the same thing but with a different texture. They also can wax. Copper has quite a few uses in the building department such as being turned into blocks for building. They can also be decompressed. And if you put four of the same kind of copper into the grid, the normal block, I mean, you can create cut copper, which is just the same thing with a different texture. Over time, blocks of copper will age, and you can prevent that by waxing them, such as using honeycomb in order to spread the honeycomb on them, which waxes them right up and will prevent them from oxidizing over time, which usually takes 30 to 50 Minecraft days. If you accidentally waxed a copper block you didn't mean to, you can always use an axe to scrape it off. And if you don't like the particular state of oxidation your copper block is at, you can also use an axe to scrape it off, one layer at a time so you can get the one you want most. All variants of copper follow the same physics. Being able to be waxed, can oxidize, they can also have their oxidation removed along with their wax, and it affects everything. And there's absolutely no difference besides texture between each state, so it's not going to weaken over time to explosions or anything like that. With normal copper ingots, the final usage for them is turning them into a spyglass with amethyst, if I can remember the recipe right. So, what you do is you craft it like that, and if you right click, you can zoom in on things without to any downsides. No durability, none of that. And if you don't like the overlay given by them, you can just press F1, which will disable the overlay which will make it very similar to some Minecraft mods zoom key. So, you can now look at your builds from far away as if they were closer. One of the other uses for copper is creating lightning rods. Lightning rods are small blocks that attract lightning, which can be used for creating witch and charged creeper farms and also keep your wooden house from burning down from a random lightning strike. So, if I summon a lightning, it will not be affected if it's created by summon command. However, if it is a natural lightning, then it will attract it towards itself, defending a small area around it. So, it will not break if it gets hit by too many lightning bolts, so no need to repair it. And 
if you have it on copper, it, the lightning will deoxidize the copper. So, there can be a little variance to your build if you can put a couple of lightning rods on it during a thunderstorm. Besides amethyst just being a decorative block, it also has one last usage for it. If you surround a normal glass block with amethyst shards on four sides, you can get tinted glass, which blocks light. So, now you can create some sort of wall, and it will be amazing for mob spawners. So you can light up the area around it, use tinted glass to block the light, and have your mob spawner be at max efficiency while having the area around it lit. However, there is no glass pane variant. So if you're hoping for that, sorry. Sometimes while you're exploring caves, you can find small blotches of dripstone with their spikes. Dripstone is a block that does pretty much nothing and can be crafted by four pointed dripstone. The pointed dripstone themselves are very dangerous as they heavily increase fall damage. So let's summon a zombie on top. And let's summon a zombie here. Now if I hit this zombie with an axe, it dies. And if I hit this one with an axe, it survives. It increases fall damage a lot. So drop traps can be more efficient because they do not scale based off of how big they are. So, a tiny spike will deal just as much damage as a 9 block spike. So, be careful. So, here we have a testing area for pointed dripstone growth. If they have lava above them, random tick speed will cause them to drip lava. The higher it is, the more likely it is going to drip. And if there's a cauldron below, it will turn into a lava cauldron, which has been a feature long requested from the Bedrock Edition of Minecraft. If you place water above them, then they can start growing by dripping. And if there's water below them and they can't drip, they will not grow. The drips can also create pointed dripstone from below, as you can see here. And this little piece of pointed dripstone will not grow because there's water there. Therefore, it doesn't have enough room. But they can be waterlogged. And if they grow big enough and contact another one, they will fuse and turn into a dripstone column, which can be walked around safely. One final feature of dripstone is if you hit it with a trident, it will drop, which means if there's a mob you don't like or a player who's trying to go after you that has dripstone above their head, you can throw a trident or maybe an arrow in order to knock the dripstone onto their head, dealing serious damage because it uses anvil-like physics to deal damage. Back here in the caves, there is a new block known as Tuff. It is purely decorative, so it doesn't have much interest in it and cannot be used in any crafting recipes. However, on the other hand, a new block known as Deep Slate has been added, which will spawn in random blobs. If an ore generates inside of it, it will turn into a deep slate ore. As you can see, this is deep slate diamond ore. They can generate in blobs 0 to 16, often found around lava pools. And if I go back through my commands in order to replace this area, you can see this blob is quite large. It reduces your mining speed when you mine it, versus normal stone. As you can see, it's taking a little bit longer to mine a normal stone. A normal stone doesn't take too long to mine with a netherite pickaxe. When mined without silk touch, it will turn into cobbled deep slate, which has a different texture than normal deep slate. Both can be used in a wide array of crafting recipes, which will be amazing for builders like me and other people who like building. It can also be used as a substitute to stone, similar to blackstone used to craft stone tools. So here we have all the variants of deep slate excluding infested deep slate, which is deep slate but infested with silverfish. So this is a lot of blocks, which will provide a wide array of new blocks and an intermediate block between black stone and normal stone. Also, Due to this only being part 1 in these items, Skulk Sensor, Bundle, Moss, Moss Carpet, 
both kinds of azalea, big and small drip leaves, spore blossom, normal and flowering azalea, hanging roots and rooted dirt, all being part of 1.18 and just being added before it got changed. I'm not going to review these items until 1.18 comes out as an official update. A small technical block, only obtained through commands, has been added, known as the light block, also brought from Bedrock Edition like the Lava Cauldron. And, when placed down, it will emit light, and it can only be seen if you have the light item in your hand. Whenever you right-click it, it changes its light level. However, this cannot be shown due to my game being bugged and not able to show light levels. So, if you're a builder in creative mode, and you don't want to add hidden sea lanterns or other forms of light into your build, you can just use the light block and edit its light from there. The final important block for 1.17 is powder snow. It's meant to generate in 1.18 mountains, however, that hasn't gotten around to being added yet. So, if it snows and there's a cauldron lying around, it will progressively get filled up. However, this process is very slow, so I'm going to skip it for the sake of time. So, if you collect it, you have to use a bucket, right-clicking a cauldron. And, as you can see, it is filled up a little. But it cannot be collected because it has to fill up in layers. It is not stackable and can only be obtained in buckets. And one place down, it has a very similar sprite to normal snow. So it's more like a trap block than anything. And when you try to stand on it, you'll fall through and you'll start progressively freezing. And then if you're in survival mode, you'll start taking freezing damage. So. It's advisable to try to escape, which it also prevents you from trying to jump out. If you equip leather, though, then the freezing effect cannot affect you. And if it's a boot, then you can walk on the powder snow, since leather boots are light enough to walk on it. However, if you try crouching on it, you'll sink in. But you can still get out by climbing inside of it. So it's a relatively dangerous block but it's easily negated by the use of leather boots. Some mobs are more prone to powder snow than others, such as the blaze. The blaze will take more freeze damage, and it will freeze a little bit quicker. However, it can still just walk out, unlike the polar bear, which is completely unaffected besides sinking in it. It cannot be frozen inside of it, and it's completely safe from it. So, if we make a hole, and put up powder snow and put a blaze in it. The blaze should start to take damage and die rather quickly from the freezing damage because it is a hot mob and requires heat to survive. Freezing damage is rather slow, but hot mobs, of course, take more damage. And like that, it has died already. Skeletons have a unique feature with this though. If they freeze in it, they can't take freezing damage. Instead, they'll start to shiver over time. So, let's just wait here for a little. And, as you can see, it has started to shiver. And, let's be prepared to let it out. Instead of freezing to death, it can actually turn into a stray when it freezes. Which is a neat little feature suggested by the community. So, if you feel like it, you can convert your skeleton farm into a stray farm for those lucrative slowness arrows, if you want them. So, onto the mobs of this update, they have added goats, a very mischievous mob known for ramming sheep and other mobs. So, they don't do much, but they can jump up very high and have a small chance to spawn as a screaming variant. If they try attacking something that is hostile, like a zombie, if it doesn't burn up, the zombie will not retaliate against them. So let's just summon more and see if we can get a screaming goat. They don't ramp too often, and they do have a cooldown. The baby ones can try to ram, however, they aren't successful whenever they try to do this. Except then. So, 
It appears that baby goats can do that, but sometimes it might fail. So, as you can see, the zombie is not attacking them back. Screaming goats, besides ramming things more often, are identical to normal goats, except that they make screaming noises. Which sounds like some developer at Mojang got really happy and made goat noises. Goats can also be bread and milk, so if you get a bucket, you can milk the goat. So, it replaces one of the functions of a cow. And it is also bred with wheat, so if you feed two with wheat, then they'll get together, and then it takes a moment, and sometimes it just won't happen if they're too far apart. It'll create a baby. So, little baby goats are possible to create. And the goats also don't drop anything, so don't try killing them for mutton or something. So, the second mob added by the Caves and Cliffs Part 1 is the fearsome, cute predator known as the axolotl. They're very, very cute and are endangered and exist in the real world, indigenous to Mexico. They swim around and often spawn in very deep caves that are filled with water, which means they're relatively rare now, but once aquifers get added in Caves and Cliffs Part 2, they'll be rather common. Their behavior includes just swimming around and attacking the nearest mob they see. And there are five variants. Each variant has identical stats and all that, which it means there are only a visual change between. So there's a yellow one, a brown one, there's a pink one, and there's a bluish pink one, along with an incredibly rare one in 1,200, rarer than pink sheep, fourth variant that looks like a mudkip from pokemon these cute little predators can also be captured in buckets for later usage so you can have a bucket of axolotl and when placed down it will convert into the correct variant that you captured originally so if you find a very rare blue orange one and catch it in a bucket you can transport it anywhere so you can transport it to your base aquarium to flex on others who don't have them. Along with that, they'll attack guardians with you. So if you summon a couple guardians and a couple of axolotls, the axolotls will go after the guardian, and they'll prioritize guardians and other hostile mobs over other mobs. And if they get hit in combat, they'll actually play dead. So if I hit one or that one. As you can see, it's ragdolling and nothing is attacking it anymore. And it has to regenerate. So, if your axolotl gets hurt in combat while taking down an ocean monument, you're not because it can recover and just go back into battle. The final thing about these axolotls is in order to breed them, you have to use a bucket of tropical fish, not a normal tropical fish specifically a bucket, which means you'll have to gather multiple tropical fishes. So I'll just grab a couple buckets of tropical fish like this, and they will consume it even if you're in creative. So that one's already been fed, and the, our colors will take one from either parent, which will be a random chance. Before that, it will have a 1 in 1,200 chance to also be the elusive blue variant. So if you have two blue parents, you can have a blue baby 100% of the time. But if you have two pink parents, there's a very small chance for the blue variant, and then it will always be the normal pink variant. The third and final mob added to Caves and Cliffs Part 1 is the Glow Squid which was elected during the vote for what mob you want to see, beating out the Moo Bloom and the Isolager. It mostly just swims around and makes particles, and doesn't actually glow. So, it's a rather uninteresting mob. However, its main us usage is from its drops. When killed, it drops the Glow Ink Sack, which can be used for the Glow Item Frame. And... If 
It also has a special interaction with signs. So, let me get to shore. The glow item frame will cause items inside of it to glow brightly. So, they can be used for dark areas, since they ignore light. If I could show that off. And, if you type something out on a sign, such as, I don't know, subscribe, you can cause it to glow, which will glow in the dark, and you can make your signs look so much cooler than before. So, before I end the video, one thing. There's a hilarious bug with axolotls that has been found by various members of the Minecraft community. If you put a lead on axolotls, they'll start orbiting you strangely, which is a bug with their AI. So, now you can have a massive ring of axolotls around you. So, it's just a small bug, but it's absolutely hilarious. And it's probably going to be patched in a small update such as 1.17.1. So, here we are on the wiki. A lot of the other changes are mostly just technical. However, there are six new death messages, which include frozen to death, frozen to death by entity if you're forced into powdered snow by something, skewered by falling stalactite, skewered while fighting something, what's impaled by stalagmite by falling on it, pushed onto a stalagmite by while fighting an entity. And there are two new game rules. Freeze damage, which determines whether powdered snow will deal damage, and player sweeping percentage. So, if you set it to zero or a negative value, Sweeping will no longer be an option to skip the night. However, if it's 50% and you're playing on a two-player world with your friend or something, only one of you has to sweep to skip the day. So, if you're on a big server or own a server, this game rule will really help you out. And along with that, data pack stuff has been changed, so you can now do a lot of stuff that I genuinely just don't understand. And one more... Um, accessibility option has been added, monochrome logo. So, now if you really don't like that bright red logo, you can turn it to dark mode. So, you don't have to burn your eyes out if it's dark out. And there's F3 plus L to generate assist performance metrics, kind of like slash debug. And 1.18k generation tools have been added to data packs, along with a ton of Particles, shaders, tags, and many, many more things I just don't understand. And five textures have been removed from the game, including the texture for zombie villagers before 1.9, the arrow.png placed outside the arrow folder that included the original purple arrow texture, the ruby item texture from long ago when they're adding emeralds, the piglin weather armor models, and the footprint particles, which are all missing from the game, anyways. So, some changes have been done, slightly changed texture, beacons are now more visible from about 1,343 blocks away instead of 256, so now they can fulfill their actual purpose of being a light way. The unused base pattern has been renamed to field pattern and given proper strings, but its ID is still labeled as base. So, here's a lot of just changes that would take quite a while to go over. Along with ores having a changed texture for a better comparison from the beginning of the video. And there's a lot more. Signs have finally got their texture. Smoker changed the top texture to remove that random stray pixel. Stone cutter can now be used for copper block variants. And two things, clocks and compasses now have proper textures made by Jaffa, instead of their original textures from before. And a ton of other small things. If you want to read each and everything, I'll link the wiki page in the description. And 303 is issues have been fixed from before 
and two things, duplication exploit with dolphins has been patched, and servers are able to bypass the EULA blacklist. So, now you can't get onto Minecraft if you've been banned. So, with that, it's the end of today's video. If you enjoyed this video, remember, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out, because this video took a lot longer than usual, and has taken quite a bit of effort to compile all these changes. So, if you want to, remember, like and subscribe. It really helps me out. So, with that, explore the cave update, take care, Gearsaw, 